finding secondary sources for what you're writing about. I'm seeing a couple of them. It's kind of what I was afraid of. Well, that's partially what I was afraid of. And then I had a student email me last night from another class who's mentioned she's found secondary sources for her, the paper she's writing for that class. The only problem is she doesn't understand them because they're written in gobbledygook. Why? Because they're English professors, probably untenured, writing away, trying to publish so that they don't perish, okay? So that they get tenure and stuff. So what do they do? They write stuff that is impenetrable, okay? Her particular topic is, you know, feminist approaches through Segal and the Green Knight. So she's reading feminist criticism of medieval literature, which is about as enlightening as a wall, okay? most of it. I mean... The stuff I've read is really bad, and especially when it deals with old English stuff, it's horrible, okay? So, all that is to say, I'm going to drop the number of secondary sources to five from seven. It's not a lot, but it makes, should make it hopefully a little bit easier. Um, so you only need to have five secondary sources. Hopefully you can find... Five within at least the sources that I named here that are fairly well written and clear. And I, I know a lot of Shakespeare criticism is dense. It's intentionally dense. Why? Because the authors are trying to sound smarter than my opinion here. The authors are trying to sound smarter than they are. They're trying to quote unquote out-intellectualize other intellectuals, okay? And because sadly, within this discipline, it is thought that if you write clear, understandable prose, it's not intellectual. If you read criticism from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, that is criticism, mostly, that college students can read and understand without a problem. I'll go even further. That was criticism non-college educated people could read and understand. Okay? Because part of the idea then was to write criticism that illuminated the text, that brought out the meaning of the text, rather than to write criticism that is reading stuff into the text. And that's what happens today for the vast majority, I believe, of criticism. So, you only need five sources, long and short of that. All right, uh, where is it, there it is. The Winter's Tale. I never really cared for The Winter's Tale as a play until last summer's National Shakespeare Festival production of it. Um, and not only because my son was in it, but I've seen The Winter's Tale in London three or four times. I think once at the Globe, no, twice at the Globe, once at the National Theater, take it back, and I think my wife and I saw it at Stratford one year. Um, it never liked it. it. It just didn't work for me. And it could be because those productions were the full play. Okay. National Shakespeare Festival, when it does a play of Shakespeare's, it always cuts out material. Okay. Antony and Cleopatra, it literally probably cut out a third of the play because it had to reduce it from roughly three hours to about two hours in production. Okay. Um, Winter's Tale, they didn't have to cut out quite that much because the Winter's Tale is not one of the longer of Shakespeare's plays. Antony, Cleopatra, Hamlet, Lear, those are probably the um, three of the longest, okay? But, and I, again, I, I can't put my finger necessarily on it, but the production done in Nashville, um, there was just something about it that made it work better. And I really, really wish they would record these and make them available, uh, but they don't. 
because some of the actors in there are what are called equity actors, that is, they're paid. And if you're paying them, then that's why you know the people come out and say, no recordings, no photographs, because essentially you then get into the issue of royalties and rights, et cetera, and they would have to you know pay them and such. So The Winter's Tale is one of Shakespeare's last plays. It's dated from about 1609, okay? Tempest is 1610, 1611. The Tempest is the last thing Shakespeare wrote solo, which is why we're going to finish with it. Winter's Tale is, is like second to the last, okay? The Tempest and the Winter's Tale are similar in some ways, dissimilar in other ways. One of the ways that they are dissimilar is that the Winter's Tale... Well, your introduction, for example, says for a marker, that it is kind of the classic version of a tragic comedy. Okay. What does the title tragic comedy imply? Both a tragedy and a comedy. It's both a tragedy and a comedy. Well, how can you be both a tragedy and a comedy? Split it down the middle. And that's exactly what Shakespeare does. The first half of this play reads like a tragedy. The second half turns everything on its head. In a tragedy, I think we've talked about this before, you know, what happens? You've got two different structures, that, or two different ways that you can view or kind of mentally compartmentalize how a tragedy works and how a comedy works. Tragedy works, you have rising action. Comedy works at the beginning, you essentially have a falling action. Tragedy up here, you reach the climax, and then you have the falling action, the denouement, okay? You have the climax here in a comedy, and then you have the rising action and the denouement. Well, what's the difference? In a tragedy, you get the complication here, things are falling apart, you have the climax, and then you have the quick unraveling. Okay? Like in Hamlet. Where is the denouement? The last two pages. Last Pretty page. much. It's when Claudius finally gets his comeuppance and Hamlet dies. Well, you know, I usually draw this so it looks, you know, like an isosceles triangle. No. With Hamlet, it's more of a right triangle. Climax, okay, so that's a little bit maybe extreme. It's like that. Boom, you're done. Over. Okay? With a comedy, the play begins and everything starts to fall apart. Kind of like in a tragedy. Okay? But at that climax... What could it then become? For example, Midsummer Night's Dream. Could Midsummer Night's Dream become a tragedy? How? Okay, but but how? What in the play would have to change? Wrong lovers end up with each other. Wrong lovers end up with each other? What else? What's another way of doing that? Have Aegeus force Hermia to marry Demetrius? Okay. Or to suffer the law of Athens? Die the death or sent off to a nunnery? Okay. How could you turn, let's go back to this in Hamlet, how could you turn Hamlet into a comedy? Not ha 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 comedy. Shakespeare classical comedy. Feel a resurrects and then Claudius still dies and Hamlet lives. Okay. The resurrect part might be a little bit of a problem, you yeah, know, without I mean, having the God come in from. Yeah, I mean, Shakespeare <laughs> does that here, but it's not quite a resurrection per se. Well, she was never dead to begin with. She was never dead to begin so with. Ophelia doesn't die. Polonius doesn't die. What happens? Maybe Claudius dies, 
Because there are comedies where somebody does die in Shakespeare. Okay. So a tragic comedy, it starts this way, but rather than having a whole bunch of people dead on the stage at the end, what happens? Because in a tragedy, you have a disrupture, or I don't need the test, do I? A rupture in society. And in comedy, you have a rupture in society. Okay? At the beginning. So what then happens? Well, usually in a tragedy, somebody's got to die in order for that rupture to be repaired. Something has, something bad has to occur. In a comedy, the rupture is repaired with nobody really dying. Okay? So the tragedy could keep going. How could this play end in a tragedy? As a tragedy, Winter's Tale. Hermione stays dead in, um, not Florizel, Perdita stays off. Maybe the, the um, shepherd okay, dies, or maybe Perdita dies for wanting to marry the young prince who is pretending to be you know, a shepherd boy, etc., etc. I mean, there's a variety of ways you could do that. So Babington says, you know, kind of fits the classic, what else can it fit as? It could also be seen as a romance. Okay? That is not a good word. Why? Because in romances, you often have someone who goes away on a journey Okay. You often have someone who's lost, who then returns. That's kind of the going away on a journey. You sometimes have the dead, or something like this, resurrected. And you always have, within a Shakespearean romance at least, some kind of element of magic. Not necessarily actual magic, but maybe this is a better way of putting it. Some kind of miraculous event. Something that cannot necessarily be logically explained. Okay? So, let's look at the Dramatis Personae and the locations. You have Leontes, King of Sicilia. Okay, we're in Sicilia, modern day Sicily. Sicily, which is Italy. Italy, off the coast of Italy. And you have Mamilius, his young son, Camillo, Antigonus, Cleomenes, and Dion, four lords of Sicilia. Then you have Hermione, his wife, Perdita, their daughter, Paulina. Wife to Antigonus, who is a lord to Leontes, and Emilia, a lady attending Hermione. Then, so those are the Sicilian actors, you know. Can't help but think of Princess Bride there. Um, then you have Polixenes, king of Bohemia. Where's Bohemia? Close, you gotta go even farther east and south. Modern day Czech Republic. Prague is the capital of Bohemia in the Middle Ages, Renaissance, and such. Okay? Modern day Prague. Well, named Prague as it was then, because it's the same place. I imagine that's where we get the word of Bohemian then. Yeah, it's exactly what, what it's where we about? get the phrase Bohemian from. What is it about Prague that we get now that we derive that from? You know, I never understood that because I've been to Prague once, and you don't get the idea of a quote-unquote bohemian lifestyle there. Um, I mean, it's not very free, loving, and no rules, you know, uh, everybody walking around, you know, playing Jimmy Buffett songs. Um, 
there has to be something from the Renaissance and or later that implies this disattention to rules and mores and such, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, Bohemia is where early middle age, well, take that back, late middle ages, uh, Jan Hus is from. Hus was an early reformer, kind of wanting to break off some of the rules of the churches. So maybe it has some of that. Other than that, I'm not quite sure. Okay. But Polixen, he's king of Bohemia. He has a son, Florizel, Archidamus, a lord, etc., an old shepherd, and such. Okay. Here's the question. Bohemia is surrounded by what? Land. Land. <clears throat> How does Autolycus get to Bohemia? Ship. He's shipwrecked on the shore. Okay. Now, I think your introduction mentions something of this. And, you know, some critics say, well, it's just, you know, shows us Shakespeare's lack of geography knowledge. And I don't think so. I think Shakespeare's doing that intentionally. Why? He's kind of showing us things are possible that maybe aren't possible, so to speak, in the real world. I mean, what does is, what is Shakespeare repeatedly do with his sources? He plays around with them. You know, he changes characters' ages. He changes characters' relationships. He changes geography to make it fit his needs. Okay? So, we see the play open. And Archidamus, notice who is attendant to Polixenes, speaks to Camillo, who is attendant to Leontes. If you shall chance, Camillo, to visit Bohemia on the like occasion, whereon my services are now on foot, you shall see, as I have said, great difference betwixt our Bohemia and your Sicilia. I think this coming summer the king of Sicilia means to pay Bohemia the visitation which he justly owes him. That is, the king of... I'm going to get these all mixed up because I do all the time. The king of Bohemia, Polixenes, has been visiting okay, Sicilia for a while. And now Camillo says, this coming summer, the king of Sicilia is going to visit Bohemia. Okay. So they talk back and forth a bit. And we see Polixenes, Leontes, their wives, children... Come in. Well, one of the children. And Leontes asks Polixenes to stay a while. Let me back up. Polixenes. Nine changes of the watery star have been the shepherd's note since we have left her throne without a bird. Time as long again would be filled up, my brother, with our thanks, and yet we should for perpetuity go hence in debt. So how long has Polixenes and his followers been in Sicilia? Nine months. Nine months. It's not an accident. Shakespeare chases nine months. Okay. So Leonti says, stay a little bit longer. He goes, no, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow. No, please, stay. Okay. These two have been best friends since their late teens, they're now 30s, okay? Maybe a little bit younger than that. <laughs> Stay, please. Leontes, seven, seven more nights. One more week. No, tomorrow. I've got to leave. Okay? So, Polixene says, line 19, Press me not, beseech you so. There is no tongue that moves me. None in the world so soon as yours can move me. So, don't press me. I really need to go. There is nobody in the world who could convince me to stay as much as you could. So it should now were there necessity in your request, although it were needful, I denied it. That is, even if there were necessity, if you had to force me to, I would still have to say no. Why? My affairs do even drag me homeward, which to hinder were in your love a whip to me, my stay to you a charge of trouble. 
I've got to attend the affairs of state. Laotes. Tongue tied our queen. Speaking to Hermione. Speak you. He's asking her. You try. I had thought, sir, to have held my peace until you had drawn oaths from him not to stay. Notice, I wasn't going to say anything until you got him to promise to stay. You, sir, charge him too coldly. Tell him you are sure all in Bohemia as well. She's telling Leontes to tell him this. He doesn't need to go back to Bohemia. Everything's fine there. Tell him you are sure all in Bohemia as well. This satisfaction the bygone day proclaimed. Say this to him. Well said, Hermione, Leontes says. Why? Because Polixenes is right next to them. He just heard everything Hermione said. To tell he longs to see his son were strong, but let him say so then. Why? Because Florizel is in Bohemia. She said, oh, I understand. Polixenes wants to go to see how his son is doing. No, she says, let him swear so and s let him swear so he shall not stay. We'll thwack him hence. So she addresses Polixenes directly. Yet of your royal presence, I'll adventure the borrow of a week. That is, one week. Stay one week with us. When at Bohemia you take my lord, I'll give him my commission to let him there a month behind the jest prefix for his party. When this summer, okay, Leontes goes to visit you, and it's time for him to come home, I'll tell him he can have an extra month. If you stay an extra week now. Yeah, good deed, Leontes. I love thee not a jar of the clock behind. What lady she her lord? You'll, you'll stay? Polixenes, no. No, but you, I, no. Verily. You put me off with limber vows, she says, line 47. But I, though you would, but I, though you would seek to unsphere the stars with oaths, there's that Ptolemaic conception of the universe again, should yet say, sir, no going, verily you shall not go. A lady's verily is as potent as a lord's. Will you go yet? Force me to keep you as a prisoner? Not like a guest, that is, well, I have to clap you in irons. So you shall pay your fees when you depart and save your thanks. How say you, my prisoner or my guest? Come on. <sighs> Fine, I'll stay. To be your prisoner should import offending, which is for me less easy to commit than you to punish. She says, okay, then I won't be your jailer. I'll be your kind hostess. Polixenes. We were fair queen, because she asks him, I'll question you of my lord's tricks and yours when you were boys. You were pretty lordings then. Polixenes, we were fair queen. Two lads that thought there was no more behind, but such a day tomorrow is today, and to be boy eternal. We thought we had our lives ahead of us. And was not my lord the verier wag of the two? You've got the gloss down there. Truly the more mischievous. She means, you know, not only with doing playful things, but illicit stuff, not drugs, but sex probably. And he says, we were as twin lambs that did frisk in the sun and bleat the one at the other. What we changed was innocence for innocence. What we did was totally innocent and harmless. We knew not the doctrine of ill-doing, nor dreamed that any did. He's kind of saying, we lived in a golden age. We were like Adam in the garden. Had we pursued that life, that is, ill-doing, and our weak spirits ne'er been higher reared with stronger blood, we should have answered heaven boldly, not guilty. You know, the imposition cleared, hereditary ours. <coughs> Hermione, oh, okay. So I, I guess since then you've tripped? Because he keeps using past tense. 
Oh, my most sacred lady, temptations have since then been born to us. For in those unfledged days was my wife a girl. Your precious self had not then crossed the eyes of my young playfellow. This notion in the Renaissance that, you know, the gaze can be enough to kind of strap you together. Hermione, grace to boot. Heaven help me. <laughs> of this make no conclusion lest you say your queen and I are devils. Well, what's he been saying before that? We were in the age of innocence. That was before I saw she who became my wife and before Leontes saw you. So she immediately takes him to me. Oh, I get what you're saying. So we tempted you. Go, go on. The offenses we have made you do will answer. That is, the sins, the faults we've made you do. If you first sinned with us, and that with us you did continue fault, and that you slipped not with any but us, okay? All, all of those last couple lines, she says, we'll answer. We, Hermione, and yeah, we don't get... Um, Polixing these as wife's name. Okay? She says, so if you only tripped with us, if you only faulted with us, Leontes, is he one yet? Has he committed, he means, has he committed to stay for a week? It's like Leontes has suddenly started paying attention to something else. He'll stay, my lord. Leontes, at my request, he would not. Hermione, my dearest, thou never spoke to better purpose. To better purpose, to better end, to get him to stay. Never? She and Leontes have spoken before, right? They're married, they have a child. He says, you've never spoken to a better purpose and intention in before. How about I do? No, but never but once. Okay. What? Have I twice said well? In other words, I've only, I've only spoken well twice? When was this before? I pray thee, tell me. Crams with praise and makes as fat as tame things, one good deed dying tongueless, but, but to the goal, my last good deed was to entreat his stay. What was my first? Okay, notice, she takes his meaning, turns a little bit. She turns words into deeds. What was my first? It has an elder sister, or I'm mistaken. Now, come, speak. Laetis, um... Why, that was when three crabbed months had soured themselves to death, ere I could make thee open thy white hand and clap thyself, my love. Then didst thou utter, I am yours forever. Leontes is saying, that's the last time you spoke well to the purpose. <clears throat> it's the first time she spoke well to the purpose, was to say, I love you. And since then, He's implying, never. Hermione, tis grace indeed. Why, lo, you know, I have spoke to the purpose twice. Okay, this is meant to be humorous. They are playing on words. Okay. The problem is, as we will come to see, there is a problem in Leontes' soul. Okay. Why, well, you know, I've spoke to the purpose twice. The one forever and a royal husband, the other for some while a friend. Notice, ultimately, what both her speakings have done. 
they've essentially won for her a man. The first one, her husband. The second one, a friend. The one for life. The second one, for a week. Okay? This is what's going on in Laonti's mind. So, she gives her hand to Polixenes. Laontes, a long aside, okay, to the audience, too hot, too hot, to mingle friendship far as mingling bloods, to mingle friendship far, to go far in mingling friendship means ending up in bed. Wow, talk about jumping to conclusions. I have tremor cordis on me. That is, palpitations of the heart. He's thinking something's going on. My heart dances, but not for joy, not joy. This entertainment may a free face put on. Free face, he means innocently. She's acting like there's nothing going on. Derive a liberty from heartiness, from bounty, from fertile bosom, and well become the agent. Actor. That is, it's entertainment now. But what happens with entertainment if you keep going? If you merely act like friends and lovers, and you keep it happening... You know, earlier, Hamlet. What does Hamlet tell his mother in her bedroom? Go not to my uncle's bed tonight. Why? Well, if you don't have a virtue, assume one. And it'll make it easier not to go tomorrow night. And not to go the next night after that. Okay? Shakespeare's saying the same thing here. If you assume a friendship, practice a friendship, eventually you will... Have a friendship, and if that friendship goes even farther, to me, I grant, but to be paddling palms. Why does he talk about paddling palms? He's talking about holding hands. Why? She gives her hand to Polixenes before he says this line. So she listens to him. She takes his hand. He takes her taking Polixenes' hand as symbolic of them sleeping together. Who asked her to ask Polixenes to stay? Leontes did. Of course, Polixenes had just said that nobody could convince him but him. Exactly. As now they, but to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as now they are. In making practiced smiles, as in a looking glass. And then to sigh, as twere, the more to the deer, the death of the deer. Oh, that is entertainment my bosom likes not, nor my brows. Mamilius, art thou my boy? Are you really my son? Or are you somebody else's? Mamilius, I, my good lord. So, talk a bit more. 138. Um, let's see here. Yeah, 138. Leontes, speaking to Mamilius, says, Affection thy intention stabs the center. Thou dost make possible things not so ill. Communicates with dreams. Things not so ill. Look at your gloss. Affection, something, affection from the word affection to something, strong passion, your intense power pierces to the very center, the soul. You make possible things normally considered fantastic, partaking as you do with the nature of dreams. How can this be? You collaborate with unreality and imagined fantasies. It's all the likelier then that such imaginings may also fasten on a real object. He's talking about himself. Just because I imagine this, just because this might be fantasy, does not mean it might not also be real. With what's unreal, thou coactive art and fellows nothing, tis very credent, credent. Thou mayst co-join with something, 
and thou dost in that beyond commission, and I find it, and that to the infection of my brains. Hamlet's ghost tells Hamlet, taint not thy mind. His brain's infected. Okay. Polixenes hears this. Well, what means, Cecilia? What the hell are you talking about? He something seems unsettled, says her. How, my lord, what cheer? how is it with you, best brother? You look as if you held a brow of much distraction. And there we're, we're with Hamlet again. Take from this distracted brow, he says. Okay. Are you moved, my lord? Polixene, uh, Hermione means, are you well? No, in Gerdest. In <laughs> Earnest. Well, in good earnest, how sometimes nature will betray its folly, its tenderness to make itself past them to heart of bosom. Looking on the lines of my boy's face, methought I did recoil 23 years and saw myself unbreached in my green velvet coat, my dagger muzzled, lest it should bite its master and so prove his ornaments so oft to do, oft to do too dangerous. Uh, methought I then was to this colonel, that is, Mamilius, this squash, this gentleman, my honest friend. Okay. 23 years old, he, the description he's given of himself 23 years old is like a young boy. Mamilius is probably about the age of seven. I don't know why, but Shakespeare likes that idea of 30. Hamlet is 30. It was 23 years ago that Yorick was put in the ground. So, Leontes says, um, My brother, line 163, are you so fond of your own prince as we do seem to be of ours? Fond, in love. Could also mean foolish. Are you so foolish about your young prince? Leontes asks, Polixenes, if I'm at home, He's all my exercise, my mirth, my matter. Now my sworn friend and then my enemy. Why? Because one day you love your children and the next day you hate your children. My parasite, my soldier, statesman, all. He says what? Florizel is everything to me. He makes a July's day short as December. And with his very childness, cures in me thoughts that would thick my blood. With his childishness, he makes me young again. The thoughts that would thick my blood are thoughts of old age and dying. And I look at him, and it's like my blood warms up and flows more easily. Leontes, so is he, Mamilius, to me. We too will walk, my lord, and leave you to your graver steps. That is, Mamilius and I, we're going to leave you now. We'll leave you with Hermione. Hermione, how thou lovest us, show in our brother's welcome. How you love me, show by how you welcome Polixenes for the rest of the week. Let what is dear in Sicily be cheap. Next to thyself and my young rover, he's a parent to my heart. Next to you, Hermione, in Mamilius, Laontes is the closest thing to me. Okay. She says, if you want us, we'll be in the garden. Could be a biblical allusion there. I'm not sure. Okay. Shall us attend you there? That is, shall we attend you there? Leontes, to your own bits dispose you. I don't know if you've got a footnote there. Yeah, act according to your own inclinations. With more bitter double meaning continued in, you'll be found, i.e. found out. You'll be found, be you beneath the sky. And he says, now, turning kind of the audience, I am angling now, though you perceive me not how I give line. How I give line. Well, what do you do when you go fishing? You got to let the line out. What 
phrase that we have that's kind of related to this, but it's more of a hangman's phrase today. Though we don't have hangman today. He's going to give them enough rope to hang themselves. So, Polixenes and Hermione leave. Notice, gone already? Well, what did he just tell them to do? Walk. They, they do what he tells them to do, and he's surprised. Inch thick, knee deep, or head, in ears a forked one. Go play, boy, he says to Mamilius. Thy mother plays. Really? Should you really be saying this to your seven-year-old son? And I play too, but so disgraced. That is, I'm playing a different game than she's playing at. There have been 190 or so. Go, go play, boy. There have been, or oh, I am much deceived, cuckolds ere now. Men have been cuckolded before me. Their wives have cheated on them. And many a man there is, even at this present. Now while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm, that little thinks she has been sluiced in his absence. And his pond fished by his next neighbor by. Pond being the wife. By Sir Smile, his neighbor. Nay, there's comfort in it. What's the comfort? Whiles other men have gates and those gates open as mine against their will. The comfort? I'm not the first man in the world to be cheated on. Should all despair that have revolted wives, the tenth of mankind would hang themselves. Leontes is saying, a tenth of all women in the world cheat on their husbands. <clears throat> physic for that, none. Or physic for it, there's none. There is no medicine you can take for this. There is no reparation you can get for this. It is a body planet that will strike where it is predominant and it is powerful. Think it from east, west, north, south. Be it concluded. No barricado for a belly. No barricade for a woman's legs. There's nothing to stop them. Know it. It will let in and out the enemy. It will let in and out will come what? A bastard child. That's what he means by the enemy. With bag and baggage. Many thousand honors have the disease and feel it not. Well, notice Mamilius hasn't left. How now, boy? So Mamilius is listening to all this. But because he's not a teenager, he's seven or eight, whoosh, completely over his head. Okay? I'm like you. Well, that's some comfort. So Leontes calls Camilla. And he speaks with Camillo a little bit. He says, how, how, why is Polixene staying? Why is Cecilia staying? He says, well, it's a good king, good queen's a tree. He says, yeah. Hmm. I think most understand, Camillo goes on, Bohemia stays here longer. Ha! Huh. Stays here longer. Why? No, to satisfy your highness and the entreaties of our most gracious mistress. Satisfy? Notice all the words Leontes latches on. Satisfy the entreaties of your mistress. Satisfy? He's going to satisfy her entreaties? Let that suffice. I have trusted thee, Camillo, with all the nearest things to my heart, as well as my chamber councils, wherein priest-like thou hast cleansed my bosom. In other words, you've been privy to all my thoughts. I from thee departed thy penitentiary. You've been like a priest. I go to you, I tell you everything, and it's like you have absolved me. But we have been deceived in thy integrity, deceived in that... 
How? Be it forbid, my lord, to bide upon it. Thou art not honest, or if thou inclinest that way, thou art a coward. Which hawks is honesty behind, restraining from course required. Okay? Camillo's like, what are you talking about? I may be negligent, foolish, and fearful. In every one of these, no man is free. Okay? Negligent, foolish, fearful. Every man, he says, is guilty of these things. But that his negligence, his folly, his fear among the infinite doings of the world, sometime puts forth. In your fears, my Lord, if ever I were willful negligent, if I intended negligence, it was my foolishness. If industriously I played the fool, it was my negligence. Not weighing well the end. If ever fearful to do a thing where I the issue doubted, that is, where I doubted whether or not I would be successful, whereof the execution did cry out against the non-performance, it was a fear which often affects the wisest. These, my lord, are such allowed infirmities that honesty is never free of. So, what have I done wrong? Let me know my trespass by its own visage. You don't, you don't see it, Camillo? But that's passed out. You have, or your eyeglass is thicker than a cuckold's horn, or heard... For to a vision so apparent, rumor cannot be mute. Notice, he's doing like Bottom does in A Midsummer Night's Dream. He's confusing seeing, hearing, etc. Okay? Or heard, for a vision so apparent, rumor cannot be mute. Or thought, for cogitation, resides not in that man that does not think. My wife is slippery. Have you not seen, heard, or thought that my wife is slippery? If thou wilt confess, or else be impudently negative, to have nor eyes, nor ears, nor thought, then say, my wife's a hobby horse. A hobby horse. Something to be playfully ridden. Okay. What did Cleopatra say about Antony when he had to leave Egypt? She says to Charmin, where do you think he is now? Think he's on ship? Think he's strident? Think he's on his horse? Oh, lucky horse, you know, to be ridden by Antony. Deserves a name as rank as any flax wench that puts to before her troth. That puts to. Today we would say puts out. Say it. Justify. I would not be a stander by to hear my sovereign mistress clouded so without my present vengeance taken. What does Camillo mean? I heard such a rumor I would defend her. Exactly. He is insane. If I knew that was true of her, I would go kill her now. He's saying, if I heard such a thing said, I would defend her honor. Why? Because for Camillo... Hermione is what? Like a goddess. A good goddess. Okay? Don't think Aphrodite, you know. <clears throat> shrew my, be shrew my heart. You never spoke what did become you less than this. In other words, you have never said anything less worthy of yourself as king than this. This is Camillo verbally slapping his lord. How dare you say such a thing? To besmirch your wife's honor. Which to reiterate, in other words, don't say it again. <laughs> Were sin as deep as that, though true. Now, the though true doesn't mean even though she really did it. Okay. Is whispering nothing? Is leaning cheek to cheek? What's he talking about whispering, leaning cheek to cheek? When Hermione was talking with Polixenes, lean in close, like they were touching cheek to cheek, is meeting noses. Well, what did they do? They kissed briefly. Kissing with <gasps> inside lip. He's talking about tongue. 
stopping the career of laughter with a sigh, a note infallible of breaking honesty, horsing foot on foot, where are they now? Walking in the garden, skulking in corners, wishing clocks more swift, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, and all eyes blind with the pen and web, but theirs, theirs only. Is this nothing? What, is, what does Leontes think he's just given Camilla? Evidence. Evidence. <laughs> Proof of his wife's unfaithfulness. Okay? We haven't read Othello, but if you read Othello, the same kind of thing happens in Othello. Othello thinks his wife, Desdemona, is cheating on him. But before he'll do anything, he tells Iago one of Shakespeare's great classic evil characters who just loves being evil. He says, give me the ocular proof. I have to see it with my own two eyes. This is before Photoshop. <laughs> and what does Iago do? He makes it so that a handkerchief that... I'm going to get this back backwards, I know. Either Othello gave to Desdemona or Desdemona gave to Othello. Falls into the wrong hands. And it is held by Othello's captain, Cassius. I think it's Cassius. And that is taken to be the ocular proof. Yeah, it's something Othello gave to Desdemona. <clears throat> okay. And now, Desdemona has dropped it. Iago gives it to his wife to give it to this other guy, okay? And Othello sees this. Well, for Othello, this handkerchief is proof of Desdemona's cheating on him, okay? Leontes, is this nothing? Why, then the world and all that in it is nothing. This covering sky is nothing. Bohemia, nothing. My wife is nothing. Playing on the Renaissance slash Shakespearean notion the female sexual, the female genitalia as nothing, a big fat O, nor nothing have these nothings, if this be nothing. Camillo, good my lord, be cured of this diseased opinion. And be times, for tis most dangerous. Notice, opinion. Opinion isn't reason. Opinion isn't necessarily fact. All right? Okay, say it is. Say it is dangerous. Tis true. No, no, it can't be. It is. You lie. <clears throat> you know it's true, Camillo, Leontes is suggesting. I say thou liest, Camillo, and I hate thee. Pronounce thee a gross lie, a mindless slave. Or else a hovering temporizer that can't with thine eyes at once see good and evil, inclining to them both. Were my wife's liver infected as her life, she would not live the running of one glass. That is, our glass. If she were physically sick as she is soul sick, she would die within an hour. Who does infect? Now, I think Camillo's saying, where is he? I'll take care of him. Why, he that wears her like a medal. That is, on his chest. How does he wear her on his chest? Probably she's on top. Hanging about his neck, bohemia. If I had servants true about me that bear eyes to see alike mine honor as their prophets, if they would see profit for themselves as well as they see my honor, they would be true servants. Their own particular thrifts, they would do that which should undo more doing. They would take care of my problem. I and thou, his cup bearer. Well, why is Camillo Polixenes' his cup bearer? Because Leontes has ordered him to do it. Who?
whom I from meaner form have benched and reared to worship. In other words, you were nothing when I raised you up. Who may see plainly as heaven sees earth and earth sees heaven how I am God. How his cupbearer mightst, what? Be spice a cup to give mine enemy a lasting wink. Kill him. Poison his cup. I, I could do this. And that with no rash potion. But with a lingering dram that should not work maliciously like poison. In other words, I could... I, I could find such a mixture, put it in his drink, so that he would what? Slowly die. It wouldn't be something where he'd be dead in an hour. What is Camillo implying? I, I could give it to him and he could die where? Back in Bohemia. <laughs> but I cannot believe this crack to be in my dread mistress. This crack, this fault, so sovereignly being honorable. I have loved, make that thy question and go rot. Dost think I am so muddy, so unsettled to appoint myself in this vexation? Sully the purity and whiteness of my sheets, which to preserve his sleep, which being spotted. Okay, I believe you. I do. I will fetch off Bohemia for it. Kill him. <laughs> Provided that when he's removed, your highness will take again your queen as yours at first. What's he telling Leontes he must do if he takes care of the Polixenes problem? Forgive his wife. Take her back. Forgive his wife. Take her back. Act like nothing has happened. Why? Even for your son's sake, and thereby for sealing the injury of tongues and courts and kingdoms known, and to silence the rest of the world. Laontes, thou dost advise me even as mine own course have set down. That is, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'll give no blemish to her honor. None. Nobody will know, just you and I. Now, I don't know about you, but if I were Camillo, I would kind of start thinking, hmm, if nobody knows but I am the king and the king doesn't want anybody else to know, what might the king then do? <laughs> Take care of the one person who knows. But he doesn't go there. So he says, fine. And with a countenance as clear as friendship, words at feast, keep with Bohemia and with your queen. That is, don't let them know. I am his cupbearer if from me... He have wholesome beverage, account me not your servant. Leontes, this is all. In other words, that's all I wanted. It's all I ask. Just a little poison. <laughs> Do it, and thou hast the one half of my heart. Do it not, you're dead. I'll do it. I will seem friendly as thou hast advised me. The king leaves. So Camillo gets, Camillo, a relatively minor character. I mean, within this he's major, but in terms of Shakespeare's other, you know, kind of major characters, he's not that important. He gets a soliloquy. Usually it's only the really major characters who get soliloquies. Oh, miserable lady. But for me, what case stand I in? Uh, what is he saying? What case? What position? Stand I in. Rock. Hard place. The rock is Leontes. What's the hard place? Death. If I don't do what Leontes wants, he's going to kill me. What can I do? How can I get out of this? I must be the poisoner of good Polixenes, and my ground to do it is the obedience of a master. One who in rebellion with himself will have all that are his so too. Notice, the king is in rebellion with himself, according to Camillo. So what did Camillo recognize about Leontes? He's not in his right mind. He is acting out of what? 
Not madness. It's one of it's a prevalent theme in Shakespeare. Not according to reason. We saw it there with Antony. Now we see it with this king. Or you could say maybe not passion. How about jealousy? How's that for a raw passion? Okay. He says the king is in rebellion with himself. And he would have all those that are his, that is those who serve him, what? Also in rebellion. What's the to himself? To this. To the king in his right mind or another way of putting it, to his soul. If I do what the king wants me to do, Camilla was saying, I will be acting in rebellion to what is actually the best interest of the king. So he can't do what the king wants him to do. Why? He's not a traitor. To do this deed, promotion follows. But if I do this deed, I will rise even higher in the kingdom. If I could find an example of thousands that instruct anointed kings and flourished after, I'd not do it. You think Shakespeare has in mind Henry IV? Sure he does. And Henry VII, who struck Henry Richard III. But since nor brass, nor stone, nor parchment bears not one, let villainy itself forswear. If I could find an example of thousands that had struck anointed kings, he says, I'd still not do it. But I can't find one where a king did that and flourished after. Well, what happened to Henry IV? He died relatively quickly. Okay. Within Shakespeare's play, at least, eight years. To do it or no is certain to me a breakneck. If I do it, I die. If I don't do it, I die. <clears throat> Happy star rain now. Here comes Bohemia. Happy, propitious, favorable star. So Polychnes comes in. This is strange. Methinks my favor here. Begins to warp, not speak. What's he talking about? Well, apparently he has seen Laontes, and Laontes did not greet him. Good day, Camillo. Hail. The, the king hath on him such a countenance as he had lost some province and a region loved as he loves himself. Well, yeah, he has, he thinks. Even now I met him with customary compliment when he, wafting his wise to the contrary and falling a lip of much contempt, speeds from me and so leads me to consider what is breeding that changeth thus his manners. Uh, I don't know. He doesn't say I don't know. He says I dare not know. That means I dare not reveal. Dare not, do not, do you know and dare not? <clears throat> Come on, tell me. Tis thereabouts, for to you yourself what you do know, you must. and cannot say you dare not. Good, Camillo. Your change, in other words, I can see it in your face, man. Something's going on. Tell me. There is a sickness which puts some of us in distemper, but I cannot name the disease, and it is caught of you that are well. That is, you're a carrier of this disease. How caught of me? Make me not sighted like the basilisk. Why? Because what can the basilisk do? Kill with its eyesight. Don't make me into this thing. I have looked on thousands who have sped the better. Huh. Come on, tell me. I, I can't. A sickness caught of me, and yet I will. I must be answered. Dost thou hear, Camillo? I conjure thee. By all the parts of man which honor does acknowledge. 
I charge you by your honor, your integrity. Tell me. I will tell you, since I'm charged in honor and by him that I think honorable. That is, I think you are honorable. He just told the audience, and I think Leontes, if he thinks Polixenes is honorable, then he has to think Leontes is not by wanting his death. I'm appointed to murder you. By whom, king? For what? He thinks, he swears, that you have touched his queen forbiddenly. Oh, then my best blood turned to an infected jelly, and my name be yoked with his that did betray the best. 418. The name of him, Judas. If I betrayed him, he says, then my name is yoked with Judas. Turn then my freshest reputation to a savor that may strike the dullest nostril where I arrive. Okay? So, how? How, how did he come to think this? I know not. But I'm sure it is safer to avoid what's grown than question how tis born. You probably shouldn't delve too deeply into that. Rather, you should flee. It therefore, if therefore you dare trust my honesty, he says... You'll leave tonight. And he says, and I'll go with you. Why? Because if I stay here, I'm a dead man. Give me thy hand, Polixen, he says, 446. Be pilot to me, and thy places shall still neighbor mine. My ships are ready. My people did expect my hands to purchase. Go. So, 2-1. Hermione comes in with Mamilius and her ladies. And... She talks with Mamilius, and she says, Tell us a tale, Mamilius, line 22. Merry or sad? What kind of tale do you want? As merry as you will. And he says, A sad tale's best for winter. The winter's tale. It's a sad tale. I have one of sprites and goblins. She says, Okay, we'll have that one. Okay. So they talk, Leontes comes in. Was he met here? His train, Camilla, with them? Uh, I saw them go to the ships. Leontes, how blessed am I in my just censure, in my true opinion. In other words, this is proof. Polixenes left. He must be guilty. A lack for lesser knowledge, how cursed in being so blessed there may be in the cup of spider steeped and one may drink apart, blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, he addresses Hermione. Give me the boy. I am glad you did not nurse him. She had a wet nurse do that. Though he does bear some signs of me, yet you have too much blood. What? Is this sport? Bear the boy in. He shall not come about her. Away with him. Let her sport herself. With that she's big with. What does he mean with that she's big with? Hermione's pregnant. How far pregnant? I don't want to say how pregnant, because you know, you're pregnant, pregnant. She's nine months pregnant. How long has Polixenes been there? Nine months. So he says you can sport with what you're pregnant with. For tis Polixenes has made thee swell thus. Hermione, but I'd say he had not, and I'll be sworn you would believe my saying, however you lean to the nayward. So, okay, now what did he swear to Camillo? If Camillo killed Leontes, excuse me, killed Polixenes, he wouldn't be smirch your honor, he wouldn't say anything. But since Camillo didn't kill Polixenes, you, my lords, look on her will, be but about to say, she is a goodly lady, and the justice of your arch will thereto add, she's tis pity, she's not honest, honorable. Pray, sir, but for this without door form, which on my faith deserves high speech and straight, blah, 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 blah. She's an adulteress. Hermione's like, whoa, did I just hear what I just heard? 
Should a villain say so, the most replenished villain in the world, he were as much more villain. You do but mistake. You have mistook, my lady, Polixenes for Laontes. That is, you mistook from Polixenes what you should have taken from Laontes. The child in her womb. He says, you cheated on me. She's a traitor, so is Camillo. 96, no by my life, privy to, I don't know what you're talking about. How will this grieve you when you shall come to clearer knowledge that you thus have published me? In other words, oh, are you going to be sorry when it's publicly known that you are wrong? Gentle, my lord, you scarce can write me throughly than to say you did mistake. You can scarce write me, that is, make reputation, make opinion of me right, but by saying, oops, sorry. She's kind of saying, where do I go to get my good reputation back? Take her to prison. 106, there's some ill plan. This isn't Laontes. This is because of the influence of one of the planets. I must be patient till the heavens look with an aspect more favorable. I have to patiently endure this until what? The proper stars line up. Good, my lords, I am not prone to weeping, as our sects commonly are. The one to which vain do, perhaps shall dry your pity. But I have the honorable grief lodged here, which burns worse than tears drown. I'm not guilty of this. Laertes, can I get a word in? Who is it that goes with me? That is, who's coming to the prison with me? Beseech your highness, my women may be with me, for you see my plight. She's due any day now. Requires it. Do not weep, good fools. There is no cause. When you shall know your mistress has deserved prison, then abound in peers. Excuse me, tears. This action I, I now go on, is for my better grace. What kind of language is she using? She's using highly religious language. She's saying, this is for my better end, my better purpose. Okay. Shakespeare is dealing with the idea here that bad things sometimes happen to good people. Why? So that good things can happen as a result. She leaves. Antigone says, um, be certain what you do, sir, lest your justice prove violence, in the which three great ones suffer, yourself, your queen, your son. One of the lords, I would lay down my life for her, my lord. Please you to accept it, that the queen is spotless. In the eyes of heaven and to you, I mean in this what you accuse her of. Antigone, and if it prove otherwise, I'll keep my stables where I lodge my wife. It's his way of saying, I believe her. Shh. Hold your pieces. Antigonus, <clears throat> it is for you we speak, not for ourselves. You are abused. That is, someone put you up to this. And that person will be damned for it. Would I knew the villain, I would land, damn him. Be she honor flowed. I've got three daughters, eldest of eleven, the second, the third, nine, and five. If this be true, they'll pay for it. By my honor, I'll geld them all. Sterilize them. Get thee to a nunnery. They are co-heirs, and I had rather glib myself than they should not produce fair issue. Leontes, no more. You smell this business with the sense as cold as it's a dead man's nose, but I do see it and feel it as you feel doing thus, and see with all the instrument. If it be so, we need no grave to bury on. <clears throat> what? Do I lack credit? You don't believe me? Leontes is saying, now how is he saying this? As king. You don't believe your king? 
I had rather you did lack than I, my lord, upon this ground, and more it would content me to have her honor true than your suspicion. Be blamed for it how you might. And then he kind of pulls out all stops. 164. Our prerogative calls not to your counsels. That is, I don't want your opinion. But our natural goodness imparts this. Which of you are stupefied or seeming so unskilled, cannot or will not, excuse me, relish a truth like this, inform yourselves, we need no more of your advice. And I wish, my liege, you had only in your silent judgment tried it without more overture, without blaring it to the world. Wish you thought about this a little bit more. Okay? King says, I'm convinced. 2-2. Two, two. Paulina comes in. She goes to the jailer and says, let me go to the queen. He says, I can't. Okay? She delivers a child, the queen does. A little girl, Paulina says, king has to be told. Okay. Leontes comes in. And a servant comes in. Leontes asks, how's the boy? Because Mamilius is suddenly sick. The servant says, uh, he took good rest tonight. Tis hoped his sickness is discharged. Leontes says, it's because of his mother's dishonor. Right? Paulina comes in with the little girl. And she says, he will hear me. I come to bring him sleep, line 33. Tis such as you that creep like shadows by him and do sign each his needless heaving. Such as you nourish the cause of his awakening. I do come with words as medicinal as true. That is, true words, honesty. So, she speaks to Leontes. They go back and forth. He says to Antigonus, can't you shut her up? Why? Because Antigonus is her husband. Can't not rule her, Leont uh, Paulina. From all, uh, from all dishonesty, he can. That is, he can rule me from dishonesty. In this, unless he take the course that you have done, commit me for committee of honor, trust that he shall not rule me. Let him you now hear. When she will take the rein, I let her run, but she'll not stumble. I come, I profess, I beseech you. And we're running out of time, so we're going to stop. There, she puts the baby down, and we'll pick up with, I don't know, around line 68 or so. And yeah, we've got to actually finish this on Tuesday. I think we can.